I do not welcome. Anyhow, welcome everyone to uh, Zoom Palestine. Um, let me lower the music a little bit. Um, it's so beautiful, the traditional Palestinian flute music. And uh, yeah, it's not going to stop it. Okay, uh, we have a lot of interesting background sounds uh, in this um, going on right now. Background to the reading of the names of uh, the people from 9 11. Hi, Mary, welcome. Hi. Because I think some of you know the story. I uh, was working on the 95th floor for fiduciary trusts for the summer of 9 11. And uh, what happened was they um, uh, they offered me a full time job. I was just working as a the summer. And, but I had been a teacher in special ed in Bed Stuy, you know, in the ghetto. And uh, I, my third graders made me promise to come back. I said, Miss Taylor, you coming back? Please come back. I said, okay. So when they offered me the job at Fiduciary Trust with a little big salary, and it was a 10 minute bike ride from my house along the river, beautiful view of a uh, nice office. Uh, cushy corporate perks, uh, thick rugs, uh, gourmet coffee, free snacks. I thought, wow, you know, uh, this would be a lot better than going back to the terrible school that I was in, but I had promised my third graders. So I said to them, look, I promised my third graders, special ed, I'd go back. So uh, please hold the job for me. I'm going to go back for a couple of weeks and see if I can stand the school. <laughs> because of school. <laughs> And um, so uh, um, that's why I'm alive, because I went back to uh, PS305, um, and that's why I wasn't killed with all my coworkers on the 95th floor, because I was supposed to be there working uh, on September 11th. And we went to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, so I would have been sitting uh, in my office. I had a nice job. What I did was... Um, you know, rich people leave trust money and sometimes they want to do something good with it. So I worked in the department that uh, uh, took trust funds and gave them to arts groups and artists. So it was really a nice job. And, uh, um, you know, I was very tempted to stay there, but my third graders made me promise. And so I kept my promise. And that's why I'm alive, folks. So uh, it's... Uh, you know, life is interesting. Um, um, you know, how it uh, really um, protects us. Um, ways. Uh, Dina, we have a blur for your picture. I don't know if you, if you, what's happening with your camera, but you know. Let's see. Let me see if I can figure out how to fix that. Um, I can't see you. Well, keep keep talking like, and let me see if I can figure out how to make it. So you can see me. <laughs> let, me, see. Let, me let me tell my um, story. Can I tell my story? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 I can. Yeah. I, I can tell my story. Please. Okay. That day is a very painful day for me because I was in the Hoboken area on yeah. the train. I always commute to New York via Hoboken back in the years, and I used to work in Amsterdam, which is 30th Street and 10th Ta and 8th Avenue. And I was on the train, and I see smoke from a distance, and the lady next to me is fudging with her phone and futzing and calling the towers. And I'm hearing her going crazy. Okay, okay, because I, I, I just saw what you called. My phone died, and it's been Let charging, and so now it's up to yeah. 60%. So I'm trying to get the charger and turn it down the phone. Okay, go ahead, buddy. So I'm listening to her and, and going crazy, and I'm like, lady, lady, just stop it. Because they started making announcements on the train, the Boonton line, heading to Hoboken to go to uh, New York. And uh, she said, what is your, what's your problem? I said, I don't have a problem. Just look outside. 
And she saw the smoke billowing and she just shut the she just, just shut the hell up and she went quiet. And I'm like, that's good. Now you're gonna be quiet. So she she started crying actually, and I'm like, you didn't even start. So when I got to Hoboken, I got on the path train and it was packed sardine. And it was the last train that went through the World Trade Center and it was diverted to 34th Street. Oh my God. And I was I always go through there every morning in 902. And they diverted it to 34. And I'm like, no, whoa, no. But that saved me. It saved me because I had to go to 30th Street. And everybody, when I walked in at work, everybody was clapping. I'm like, what is your problem? They go, you're not listening, you're not watching. Weren't you taking that train? I said, no, I got diverted. And I was saved myself, but the rest of the day, everybody was crying and everybody was huddled on the phone, on the radios, and it was surreal. I couldn't get home. I couldn't get back to Jersey. That's my story. Well, you were saved because if you had gone into the path into the World Trade Center, <laughs> my, my wife, when I called her, she wouldn't stop sobbing. I'm like, what is your problem? Yeah. And I sort of froze because I am not from New York, but I am. I regressed back to my wars and Jerusalem and Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah. and nobody feels their pain. Yeah. When yeah. that happened, I yeah. got quiet. Instead of talking for two weeks, I didn't talk. And my wife goes, suddenly you shut the hell up. I'm like, yeah, what is wrong with you? I said a lot of stuff, but one of them is now they feel the pain of what the Middle East goes through. She said, that's very selfish of you. I said, no, nobody feels our pain for 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. And now the pain is up close and personal. I'm a yeah. New Yorker. Yeah, yeah. Nobody feels the pain of other people. Yeah. Yeah. So I went quiet for two weeks. Yeah. That's my story. Wow, Farid. So our angels, both of our angels kept us alive because God wanted us to stick around. So yeah. He, he I was a for us. He, and I think part of the reason why both of us were saved is because we have to be workers for peace and we have to fight all the uh, violence and the greed and corruption. Um, that has created havoc in, in our world for so long. And I think that, you know, we, we were kept around for a mission, you know, uh, we're, we're, both of we're us are loud mouth. We're, we're meant to be alive because I admire you, Jackie, for your perseverance and for your resilience. And yeah. everybody is after you, but you still talk, you still say what you want to say. And I'm the same like you are. I'll say what I want to say. Go ahead, chop my head off, but let me say right, it first. Right. So. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to shut up. <laughs> Mary, welcome. Uh, do you have a story to share? Uh, uh, a 9-11, you're a New Yorker. I um, know. Uh, I was safe. I remember are you? I was in, um, uh, I, was, I uh, had a job as a librarian in a middle school in Canarsie, Brooklyn. Ah, so and we were both. There were constantly uh, students go leaving the room getting phone calls, then leaving the room, getting phone calls and leaving the room. It was not announced to the, to the staff what was happening. Can you oh. show yourself? And eventually, eventually it was, I don't remember that detail and we went home and I remember the sky was so beautiful that day. It was- Yes, I remember that. The yeah. blue yeah. and the white, it was just a beautiful day. And when I see a beautiful day like that, when I'm walking, I'm reminded of 9-11. And can uh, we see you? Can we see you? Oh yeah, well, uh, I look a wreck, so I, <laughs> I mean, uh, okay, you can We're see me a wreck. We're all wreck. <laughs> <laughs> oh my there god. <laughs> no, oh, I got people today. <laughs> yeah, too. so uh, yeah, you know, I, I read yesterday that everybody can remember what happened that day to them wherever they were yeah. um right you no know? yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and from that point on i was glued to the television and reading articles and uh horrified when they yeah whitney T 
Todd Whitman said that there was, you didn't have to be, you, you can go to the area, don't worry, it's not dangerous. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. you, uh, anyway, so anyway, I'm going to, I'm just going to listen to your stories. Uh, but yeah. that, that's well, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I was um, uh, in bed which is a little closer. Uh, to Manhattan, so uh, we saw it very clearly uh, from our building at PS405, uh, and uh, uh, we uh, were all freaked out, and particularly me, because I had just left there, and all my co-workers that I had worked with for three months, and I really liked very much, uh, were all on, um, you know, uh, uh, 95th floor and killed, so, uh, and then I walked home, uh, because the trains weren't working, remember, and I walked through much of lower Manhattan, breathing in all the shit because West Beth is, you know, just about a mile and a half north of the World Trade Center. And um, what happened was uh, on Friday, I ended up in the hospital with inhalation pneumonia because I had breathed that garbage in. And I remember going to the emergency room and, and being uh, next to a policeman who looked I'll never forget the expression on his face. I guess he'd gotten stuff in his eyes. They were working down on the pile, looking for bodies. And, and the, the expression on that young policeman's face, I'll just never forget it, you know, what he went through and seeing all of his friends killed. We were very close. We were bringing food. Uh, my friend, Peter Tomas, who just died 101, organized bringing food to the precinct. Um, we lost a lot of our policemen there. Some of them I knew you know, who had uh, helped me when people were, when I had this crazy stalker <laughs> and, you know, and various other incidents in my life. I, I was very fond of some of the six precinct cops because they were really, they were village cops, you know, so they were kind of like villagey. Uh, and uh, it just broke my heart because we lost so many of them. And uh, uh, anyhow, so that's, uh, yeah, so I ended up with asthma. Uh, which I never had in my life. And my apartment is still full of 9-11 smoke because we're north of Canal Street and they would only send help to clean up apartments if you were south of Canal Street, you know, and like Whitman uh, saying, oh, everything is fine. So my health has, you know, really suffered from 9-11. Um, but anyway, I want to explain in the background, uh, you'll hear uh, several uh, crazy things that, they're reading the names of 9-11 uh, victims, which I always listen to. Um, and uh, they are, uh, they had Bruce Springsteen sing some before, uh, and uh, it's very moving and touching. And I know some of the names, of course, of the people that I work with, so out of respect for them. Uh, and, and I always listen to the names. But outside West Beth Artist Housing, my building, the uh, residence council, who's the mafia that runs the building, they uh, um, opted to rent our courtyard, the community room where I was supposed to show my film commemorating 9-11, and I got bounced to 9-12. They rented the whole space, the courtyard, the community room, uh, some floors in the building with painting studios too, of the fashion week people. So right now we're having a fashion week event outside my window where they're playing music and I don't know, I guess models are walking around in clothes while they're reading the names of those killed on 9-11 while they had the uh, minute of silence. Uh, I think it was uh, that they asked everybody to be quiet to remember the names that was about an hour ago. I just find it pretty sacrilegious uh, that my building uh, to commemorate 9-11 is ignoring it uh, by having a fashion week event in the building. And it, uh, it really bothers me because it's like, we haven't learned the lessons of 9-11. Um, you know, uh, we need to be uh, thinking of peace and reconciliation, harmony between peoples and the events of today in all institutions in New York should be dedicated to remembering 9-11 and, and, and thinking of the lessons uh, that we have to learn about peace. So I'm very disappointed that the um, West Beth Artist Residence Council, who was nice enough to sponsor my event and letting me use the community room 
for free tomorrow so I don't have to pay $30. Um, and they put up signs for my event. But uh, I, it's it's disheartening to be listening to uh, the Fashion Week thing out my window while I'm listening to the names. So anyhow, um, that's the, the sounds you're hearing uh, in the background. Um, so uh, I was the reason I'm doing this program, and I and I thought a lot about doing this, and I said, no, you better not do it. Uh, you'll get in trouble. Uh, it's because Fareed reads me very well. He says, you know, you're not going to keep your mouth shut. Particularly, I was upset uh, when I heard this week that Spike Lee had, was pressured to edit out uh, all the uh, alternate theories. Now, I'm not calling them conspiracy theories because I think that's a pejorative term. I'm not using that term. But the alternate theories that could are plausible and we don't know what the truth is and maybe we'll never know in our lifetime but that he was forced to edit out alternate theories about 9-11 from his documentary, Epicenter. I'm very disappointed in Spike Lee. I watched the first uh, two programs. It basically interviews the people um, about COVID and then he goes on 9-11 in the last, the final section. His final session, he edited out references to the alternate theories, uh, particularly this one guy who was uh, Richard Dent, I think is his name, who was the head of the uh, Association of Engineers and Architects, who uh, challenged the idea of the, um, uh, that the, the buildings collapsed on their own, and he felt that there was a controlled demolition, which uh, I'll talk about it later, uh, which is something that I support because I saw people coming into the building, workers who didn't belong to the World Trade Center, carrying heavy bags of stuff, equipment or whatever, into my fiduciary trust 95th floor through sacred, through secret uh, corridors that we were not allowed in. A couple of them, a couple of times they came in, they didn't talk to anybody. They were very weird. It was very weird on our floor. As we watched them, we all talked to each other like, what are these dudes doing? Who are they? What are they doing? What are they carrying it? So I'm convinced that these were the guys carrying in the explosives. Um, because if you see pictures of the buildings, you see explosives coming out of the sides of the buildings. Um, so uh, I was a witness. I'm probably the only witness alive from my company who saw that and I published it in uh, newspapers and and uh, I'm supposed to make an affidavit and give it to some group of lawyers who are working on it but um, you know I saw some great weird stuff the month before the summer before the whole summer before uh, working there and and uh, my uh, co-workers also thought it was weird. It wasn't just me being my usual paranoid. So anyhow, um, we're going to talk about the uh, verboten topic that nobody's supposed to talk about, which is 9-11. Uh, and we have to understand that this topic belongs in discussion of Palestine because the events of 9-11 still affect the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Because what happened in 9-11 has been used against the Palestinians. So we're gonna share, I'm gonna share a, a very good article with you uh, that talks exactly about that. Because uh, the, the situation for Palestinians grew much worse because of 9-11. And here's an article um, from NPR, um, how the events of 9-11 still affect the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Instead of reading it, I'm gonna play. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Waystar. On a journey to transform healthcare payments, helping healthcare providers streamline the revenue cycle and offer a better financial experience for patients. A whole new future is opening up. Visit Waystar.com to learn more. 20 years ago this week, planes crashed into the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania. On the other side of the world, Israelis and Palestinians were deep into the Second Intifada. NPR's Daniel Estrin spoke to some who were involved in that fight. They think that the aftermath of 9-11 affected their conflict in ways still evident today. 
On September 11, 2001, American television viewers saw this scene from Jerusalem. This is Fox News. The V sign for victory being displayed uh, in uh, East Jerusalem today among jubilant Palestinians. Some were jubilant to see Israel's ally America hit. Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian leader, ordered his security services to quickly quash any scattered celebrations. And he issued a statement. Aid Nabil Amr tells me he helped him draft it. We want to send a message to the world. We are not with Al-Qaeda and its activities, that we are completely against the terror. At that time, the Second Intifada, the Palestinian uprising with militant bombings and shootings and attacks by Israeli troops, had been going on for a year. Palestinians were fighting for an independent state, but Amr says Arafat was worried Palestinians would be labeled terrorists. Nasser Shuma was once a leader of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade's militant group. We walk up stone steps to a historic Turkish bathhouse in the West Bank city of Nablus, where his men would hold meetings. He says Arafat's emissaries told them he wanted to take a major step and end the Intifada because America had declared war on terror. He feared the world wouldn't be sympathetic to the Palestinians' armed fight. And for a short time, violence decreased. Retired Israeli Army Brigadier General Shlomo Brom thinks it was an opportunity that could have changed history. Yes, sir, Arafat wanted to distance himself from this uh, exodus of evil. And the only way to do it was uh, to stop uh, the Intifada. But he didn't stop. And not because of Yes, sir, Arafat, because of the Israeli side. We missed this opportunity. In January 2002, Israel killed a top West Bank militant, restarting a policy of assassinations. When you get this intelligence about the bad guys, you want to kill them. So we couldn't overcome the, the urge. Not everyone puts the blame on Israel. And former commander Zuma says Arafat couldn't control all the militants anyway. In March 2002, a suicide bomber killed 30 civilians during a Passover meal at an Israeli hotel. Amos Gilad was a senior army officer then. In Passover, uh, the moment I got the message, I said, that's it. Now we would invade. Six months after 9-11, Israel launched a full-scale invasion of the West Bank with tanks on the streets, killing hundreds of Palestinians. Israel's view was the U.S. would understand. It's an American expression. Very simple one. Terror is terror. The peace process for a two-state solution never fully regained momentum. Israelis widely believe their security requires keeping the West Bank under their control. Retired Brigadier General Brom says that's the legacy of the gruesome violence of the Intifada. It completely destroyed the mutual uh, trust between the two sides. Completely destroyed and it never returned. <laughs> Nasser Jumat, the former militant, thinks the aftermath of the September 11th attacks brought an end to the dream of a Palestinian state, as the U.S. and Arab states had other things to deal with besides forcing compromise between Israelis and Palestinians. Daniel Estrin, NPR News, Nablus, the West Bank. Okay. And now more from NPR. Okay, so Live from NPR News, I'm Barbara Klein in Shanksville. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, is very uh, interesting uh, insight uh, because 9-11 happened at a strategic time in Palestine during the Intifada. Uh, Arafat was pulling back from violence um, and Israel had an opportunity to uh, negotiate, try to make peace. Instead, it began the policy of assassination. So uh, this, uh, and of course, then the war on terror uh, was used, all Israel had to say was the Palestinians are terrorists, and America now would just look the other way and let them do whatever they want. Um, and I thought also a point that they made that uh, now, since all Muslims are considered terrorists, that the other uh, Muslim countries, the other Arab countries now had to deal with that. Um, and so they, they lost their focus on helping Palestine. So this worked to Israel's advantage. So um, here's an article on how Israel took advantage of 9-11 to wage war on Palestine. 
Um, and it, it goes, uh, uh, Israel's leaders exploited the U.S. reaction to 9-11 to demonize Palestinian resistance to the occupation. They have used the discourse of counterterrorism to entrench a system of apartheid while exporting repressive methods and weapons around the world. So actually, uh, uh, 9-11 worked in, in Palestine's, in, in Israel's interests both in Palestine and globally, because suddenly uh, every country around the world is afraid of terror and Israel is willing to sell them military equipment. So it made uh, profit financially and economically off of 9-11 as well as politically. So um, here's a, uh, the article, uh, a Palestinian protester raises a national flag as a member of the IDF forces points his gun uh, gun in the occupied West Bank. The impact of the US law war led war on terror on the Palestinian people, their movement and its leadership has been far reaching and devastating. The aftermath of the 9-11 attacks provided Israel with the ideal political and diplomatic conditions to achieve long standing goals. Uh, the ensuing developments resulted in no fewer than 10,000 Palestinian deaths. 10,000. The imprisonment or assassination of hundreds of key leaders and the fundamental restructuring of the Israel-Palestinian relations on a geostrategic, geostrategic, political, and institutional levels, all to Israel's advantage. Let me get rid of my cats and spray them, go, go away, go, go, go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, they love to be on um, face on Zoom. Um, okay, Israel also greatly expanded its construction of Jewish only colonies throughout the 1967 occupied Palestinian territories, erected a 700 kilometer separation wall both around and within the West Bank and imposed a de facto apartheid regime across historical Palestine that incorporates the 5 million Palestinians of the uh, OPT and the 2 million Palestinian citizens of Israel. So that's important history, folks, that um, they uh, killed over 10,000 Palestinians, imprisoned, assassinated leaders, and expanded the settlements and erected the separation wall, finished erecting the separation wall. Wow, all after 9-11. So that's why it's so important to connect the dots between events. Um, okay, uh, so uh, our analysis of the war on terror and its impact on Palestine should not end with a tally of deaths or an elaboration on the political dynamics that emerged from the post 9-11 era. The Palestinian question has always occupied a central place in Arab, Israeli, and US Middle East conflict dynamics. Israel also performs a key role in US attempts to assert its hegemony across the Middle East. We therefore need to examine the repercussions of these policies that have extended beyond Palestine as well. So uh, this is um, a, a spider's web, uh, a complexity. All right, sticking point. The question of Palestine has long constituted a sticking point for the United States in establishing its regional hegemony. Despite repeated Israeli massacres, wars, aggressive settler colonialism and active policies of ethnic cleansing and military occupation, Palestinian national claims and resistance to the Zionist project of the Palestinian homeland have never ended. The question of Palestine has long constituted a sticking point for the US in establishing its regional hegemony. These claims have prevented US aligned Arab states from formalizing peace agreements with Israel out of tokenistic solidarity with the Palestinian cause. Although we know that Saudi Arabia and some of the uh, Gulf states have now 
um, made some agreements with them. It has kept an alternative anti-colonial political imagination alive, whether pan-Arab socialist or pan-Islamist, among a population of 300 million in a region that contains 40% of the world's proven oil reserves and its situation on key east-west trade routes. Palestine has thus posed a threat to the U.S. regional order, which incorporates both the both moderate Arab states, namely U.S.-backed dictators, as well as Israel. The latter amounts to a dependent pro-Western satellite colony, once established by Britain in the heart of the Levant, but inherited by the United States after the collapse of the British Empire in post-war decades. Since 1967, Israel has also faced a growing dilemma regarding the continued and increasing demographic presence of Palestinians within historic, historical Palestine, both Israel and the OPT. OPT is occupied Palestinian territories. This presence threatens to negate the very basis of the self-described Jewish democratic state. And I think, uh, and Farid, you'll agree with me that one of the great fears they have is because of the Arab population is expanding rapidly and demographically uh, will, um, I, I don't know how many years, but will equal or outdo the uh, Jewish population. And this panics uh, Israel. So I think this is one of the reasons why uh, they enjoy killing children, they uh, shoot pregnant women or, or put them in prison or uh, beat, beat them up. Um, they want to reduce the population. So getting rid of women and children is a, a handy way to do this. Uh, and this is um, uh, part of their strategy. Um, so um, Israel has been selectively, has been keen to selectively go away, has been keen to selectively, uh, I just lost my, my place because my um, cat got on my computer again. Um, all right, before 9-11, the United States and its Western allies were trying to manage these dilemmas through the framework of the Oslo peace process, which had begun in September 1993. The end of the Cold War presented Washington with a unique set of historical circumstances to assert its unipolar dominance both regionally and globally. Although its supporters marketed the peace process as a bona fide means to find a political solution to what they call the Israeli-Palestine conflict through negotiations, the process lacked any internal mechanism to link its outcomes to international law that would have protected Palestinian rights. This subsequently transformed the peace process into an opportunity for Israel to exploit the asymmetrical power relations between the parties to its advantage. Israel was keen to selectively redeploy from Palestinian residential concentrations of the OPT, locking these areas into self-governing autonomy arrangements that would be akin to the South African Bantustans under the apartheid regime. The Western states that back the peace, the Western states that back the peace process acted as if it had resolved Israel's dilemmas about the occupation and its own Jewish and democratic characters by granting the newly established Palestinian Authority, PA, jurisdiction over just 20% of the OPT divided into different cantons. I didn't realize that the PA is only over 20%. That's crazy. Wow. Um, the US-led bloc also failed to condemn or sanction Israel's aggressive expansion of settlements into the in the OPT after 1993. So um, this is very interesting uh, article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I'll, I'll post a link to it uh, because 
This is uh, very important. It talks now uh, from Camp David to 9-11, and then Israel's war on terror, sanctioned by the United States, so-called Pax Americana, Arab uprisings, and the globalizing war, and ending the war on terror. Um, let's read that last paragraph. And this is very important historical information to uh, help understand um, the current situation. And you have to look at the past to understand the present. Ending the war on terror. The US war on terror has clearly inflicted enormous costs on the victims in the main theater, theaters, Iraq and Afghanistan. After these countries, we could probably place the Palestinian case in an unbelievable third place among these political arenas that it has most directly affected. Yet, victory through the deployment of military might, have, might has proved elusive, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Palestine. Such methods are incapable of solving the core political questions at stake. And we're certainly seeing that now in Afghanistan. In view of the terrible human costs, it is incumbent upon US political forces to press for an immediate and unconstitutional, unconditional end to the policies of the war on terror. They must also work for the political questions at the heart of these conflicts to be addressed on the basis of principles enshrined in international law, in particular, the right of peoples to self-determination. So uh, this um, is very uh, revealing of how the entire process, the Oslo process, 9-11, all has worked into uh, Israel's advantage and Palestine's disadvantage. Um, the, so we've discussed the first two points that we talked about. Uh, how uh, how 9-11 benefited Israel. Now we're gonna look about, was there Israeli foreknowledge of what was going on? Okay, this is a very uh, sensitive topic, um, but very important. And actually, believe it or not, uh, in, uh, in 2011, 2001, uh, Fox News, did a story on this. Um, can you all see the uh, article uh, that starts the, the dancing Israelis? FBI docs shed light on apparent Mossad foreknowledge of 9-11 attacks. Um, the, uh, as another 9-11 anniversary comes and goes, many questions surrounding the events remain unanswered. Uh, here's an updated article on um, Oh, this is from actually 2019. Um, and what's interesting is the new docs that are coming out, uh, the 9-11 families are demanding the release and we'll talk about them in a minute. They're all targeting Saudi Arabia and I haven't seen one, one tiny reference to Israel's involvement in the docs. So uh, we'll see when they come out if that's redacted uh, or if they actually talk about it. So let's, New York for nearly two decades, one of the most overlooked and little known, made, uh, little known arrests made in the aftermath of 7 11 attacks was that of the so-called high fivers or the dancing Israelis. However, new information released by the FBI has brought fresh scrutiny to the possibility that the dancing Israelis at least two of whom were known Mossad operatives, had prior knowledge of the attacks on the World Trade Center. Shortly after 8.45 a.m. on the day of the attacks, just minutes after the first plane struck the World Trade Center, five men, later revealed to be Israeli nationals, had positioned themselves in the parking lot of the Doric apartment complex in Union City, New Jersey, where they were seen taking pictures and filming the attacks while also celebrating the destruction of the towers and high-fiving each other. And Trump called these guys Muslims. He said they were Muslims celebrating the destruction of the towers, but actually, no, they were Israelis. <laughs> At least one eyewitness interviewed by the FBI had seen the Israelis van 
in the parking lot as early as 8 a.m. that day, more than 40 minutes prior to the attack. The story received coverage in U.S. mainstream media at the time, but has been largely forgotten. The men, Sivan Kurtzberg, Paul Kurtzberg, Oded Eleanor, Yaran Shimuel, and Omar Marmari, were subsequently apprehended by law enforcement and claimed to be Israeli tourists on a working holiday in the United States where they were employed by a moving company called Urban Moving Systems. Upon his arrest, Stephen Kurtzberg told the arresting officer, we are Israelis, we are not your problem. Your problems are not our problems. See, Palestinians are the problems. For years, the official story has been that these individuals, while they had engaged in immature behavior by celebrating and being visibly happy on their documenting of the attacks, had no prior knowledge of the attack. However, newly released FBI copies of the photos taken by the five Israelis strongly suggest that these individuals had prior knowledge of the attacks on the World Trade Center. The copies of the photos were obtained via a request made by a privacy. So here are the photos that these uh, crazy Israelis took ahead of time. Um, according to former high-ranking American intelligence official who spoke to Jewish Daily Forward, the FBI concluded in its investigation that the five Israelis arrested were conducting a Mossad surveillance mission and that their employer, Urban Moving Systems of Weehawk in New Jersey, served as a front. At least two of the men arrested were determined to have, to, were, to have direct links to the Mossad after their names appeared in the CIA FBI database of foreign intelligence operatives. According to one of their lawyers, one of the men, Paul Kurtzberg, had previously worked for Mossad in another country prior to arriving in the U.S. Another of those arrested, Oded El Elid Elner, um, subsequently stated on Israeli TV that the five Israelis had been in New York at the time to document the event, meaning the attack of the World Trade Center. Well, that obviously means they knew about it ahead of time. Okay. Um, the uh, release of the photo is notable, of the photos is notable because Responses to prior uh, requests to the Department of Justice for a Freedom of Information Act, uh, which oversees the FBI, had previously claimed that all the photos taken by the Israeli nationals had been destroyed in January 2014. The photos themselves are heavily redacted, making it impossible to see the Israeli facial expressions. However, previously declassified, yet heavily redacted FBI reports state that the Israelis are visibly happy in nearly every photo, even when the burning towers are in the background. The photos released are also not original copies, but instead appear to be photocopies of photocopies of the original picture, which gives them a chance to, uh, you know, uh, alter it. Um, and the, um, so the, uh, uh, of the original 76, 76 pictures developed by the authorities from the camera in the Israeli's possession, only 14 were released. So they took 76 photos. Um, based on the impressions of the French website, Panasma, and subsequently Mint Press, three of these photos, despite the heavy redaction and poor quality, appear damning. Since 2001, even though the photos were never released until now, it has been known that one of the Israelis arrested, Sivan Kurzberg, was seen in a photo holding a lighted lighter in the foreground with the smoldering wreckage of the Twin Towers in the background, according to Stephen Norgoish, the lawyer for the five Israelis. So he's holding a lighter in front of the um, towers. It's pretty sick. Uh, okay, the picture of Kurzberg with the lit lighter appears to be photo five, the new release, yet the picture uh, released includes a visible date of September 10th, the day before the attacks, as do two other photos, images seven and eight in the collection. Wow, so that he was showing the lighter the day before 
uh, in, in front of the towers. Whereas all the photos show only the month and the year. The uh, release did not provide any information as to this apparent discrepancy in dates. While this can be explained away as the camera in question being programmed with a slightly inaccurate date, that doesn't seem to be the case for two reasons. First, only three out of the 14 pictures appear to carry that date. And second, previously declassified FBI reports report an eyewitness adamantly stating that Stephen Kurtzberg had visited the Dork apartments on September 10th at around 3 p.m. with at least one other man with whom he was conversing in a foreign language and had identified himself as a construction worker to a tenant. Wow, okay. In addition, the FBI report notes that a van from Urban Movie Systems, the company that employed the five Israelis at the time of the arrest, was present and involved in moving a tenant out of the complex on September 10th, and that the movers all had foreign accents. Thus, images five, seven, and eight may have been taken at the same complex a day before the attacks. Wow, this raises two possibilities. First, that there are two images of Kurtzberg with a lit lighter in front of the towers, one taken before the attack and one at the time of the attack, that the FBI released only one of them. Second, that Kurtzberg took the picture with the lighter only the day before the attack and his lawyer misrepresented the contents of the photo to the New York Times. Given the background of the photo, particularly the state of the towers, is indiscernible in the recently released photo, it's difficult to determine which is the case. However, other analysts have implemented, interpreted the photos differently. Ryan Dawson cites that the police report that details the clothing of some of the Israelis at the time of their arrest and use that to link identities to the redacted faces in the pictures. He believes that the Israeli holding the lighter is not Sidon Kurtzberg, but his brother Paul. Meanwhile, the person who filed the FOIA request that resulted in the pictures release, who wishes to remain anonymous, thought that Omar Mamari was more likely to be the man. Okay, so uh, we don't know, it's very mysterious. Um, and uh, here's a, this paragraph questions uh, one of the 9-11 loose ends cover-ups. So they're uh, feeling that the uh, government is definitely covering up uh, this whole situation of photos. Um, and here's another interesting thing. Tourists with cash stuff box, socks, box cutters, and explosives. Beyond the photos and observed activities of the so-called dancing Israelis, it's worth revisiting several other suspicious circumstances linked to their arrests that clearly show the men in question were hardly tourists <coughs> they claim to be. One often cited example is the fact that one of the men, uh, Oded Elner, had a white sock like sack filled with $54,700 in cash, as well as maps of the city with certain places highlighted, and box cutters. In addition, the van in which the Israelis were arrested was oddly lacking equipment typically used in a moving company's daily duties, according to the FBI. Instead, <laughs> they had a $57,000 in box cutters. Uh, the uh, explosive res residue, the declassified FBI report states, a search of the van and individuals was conducted at the time of the vehicle stop. This vehicle was also searched by a trained bomb sniffing dog, which yielded a positive result for the presence of explosive traces. Wow. Swabs of the vehicle's interior were taken, and those samples were sent to the FBI lab for further analysis. Final results are still pending. I wonder if these are the guys who came up to my floor uh, and planted explosives. In addition, the strange nature of some of the Israelis' possessions in the van and on their person, the company that employed them, Urban Moving Systems, was of special interest to the FBI, which concluded that the company was likely a fraudulent operation. Upon a search of the company's premises, the FBI noticed little evidence of legitimate business operation was found. I also noted an unusually large number of computers relative to the number of employees in such a small business, and that further investigation identified several pseudonames or aliases associated with urban moving systems. So um, 
I'm not going to uh, um, read uh, the whole issue, uh, the whole um, article, um, but uh, it's worth, certainly worthwhile noting uh, that uh, there's a lot of very suspicious activity. Joining us now, what great friend of the now, show, uh, is the reporter with the, Whitney um, Webb. Hey, Whitney, how you doing this morning? Video by Whitney Webb. Hi, I'm doing well. Great to be with y'all. Oh, great to have you again. Which, uh, Can you explain to me? You did a, a piece about this, but I I I want to go through this factually because you are a great reporter. What's the deal? Take us through the dancing Israeli story with as little conjecture. What do we know for sure about the so-called dancing Israelis? Okay, so um, this story, I did a report about it in May because there was a Freedom of Information uh, a, a, a FOA request um, that a private citizen actually obtained that showed these these photos about this case that had been known for some time but had really gotten buried. And actually, um, in the immediate aftermath um, of September 11th, there was a lot of, uh, there was mainstream media coverage of this case because basically what had happened is that um, in the Doric apartment complex, in Union City, New Jersey, um, I think one or two minutes after the first uh, plane struck the World uh, Trade Center, um, people at that apartment uh, complex saw five men who were celebrating and high-fiving and taking pictures on top of a van and posing in front of the, um, of the towers while the attacks were ongoing. And, um, they, uh, and some of those witnesses later called the police, and these men were subsequent, subsequently arrested. So they were all uh, later revealed to be um, Israeli nationals. They claimed to be there on a working holiday, working for a company called Urban Moving Systems. And Urban Moving Systems, after the FBI's investigation uh, into these men started, was revealed to be a front for the Mossad. And they believe uh, that um, they were conducting a, a, quote, surveillance mission for the Mossad. And two of the men arrested um, or came up in a CIA FBI uh, database of foreign intelligence operatives and were known to be um, known uh, members of the Mossad, and they were celebrating on 9-11. One of the eyewitnesses um, uh, at the apartment complex said that their van in there um, as early as 8 a.m., which is, you know, over 40 minutes before, um, you know, the, the first attack or the first plane hit the building, and that they'd been there waiting for several minutes. Um, one of the men, according to the FBI, had visited the apartment complex the day before um, the attacks, um, and there is a lot of other really disturbing information in this FBI report. It's, um, it's like 600 pages, so it's really hard to go over um, everything that that FBI report contains, but um, it, you, you can find it on archive.org. I linked to it in my report on it. Um, but in, in these pictures, you know, uh, we, we see some really disturbing poses. So one of these guys uh, who's believed to be either C, uh, Stephen Kurzberg or his brother, Paul Kurzberg, um, are holding a lighter in front of the building um, as it's on fire. Um, and, you know, they're pointing and posing um, the FBI said that in, in the pictures that were developed, they were all, quote, visibly happy and, and jovial um, are the words that they used. And then, of course, the FBI asked, um, this was a really heavily redacted FBI report, by the way, and it didn't come out, I don't believe, in 2011. Um, that report specifically um, when it was publicly released. But um, one of the questions in there it asked in the FBI report is, um, did the Israeli nationals have foreknowledge of the events at the World Trade Center and were they filming the events prior to and in, in, in anticipation of the explosion? And the answer to that question is a page and a half and it, it was redacted in its entirety. So um, that strongly suggests that the FBI um, did not determine the answer to be a simple no. Um, and I, I think that is uh, really telling, as is the fact that this story was very quickly buried. And there are a lot of other odd things um, okay, that were reported wait, wait. in connection with the arrest of the, these, um, these individuals. Sorry, if I can just continue really quick. Um, yeah. One of the men, uh, when they were arrested, he was found to have a sock stuffed with $4,700 in cash. Um, they had box cutters, even though they were working for the supposed moving company, they had no equipment typically used in a moving company's daily duties, according to the FBI, and the, um, the bomb sniffing dog found, uh, the po uh, found presence of explosive traces in their van. So this is just some of the stuff that's in this FBI report. I would encourage everyone who is shocked by what they're hearing right now to please read it if you have the time. 
just go straight to the source document. Don't take my word for it. It's there. Okay. Uh, another thing I want to bring up, which could lead us to a segue to the, the Epstein stuff that I did recently, is that the company's owner, the, the owner of this Mossad front company where these, these um, celebrating Israelis um, worked, um, his name was Dominic Suter, and at, two days after he was questioned by the FBI, that entire company was abandoned. Um, just, just everything was left behind, and this guy um, was an Israeli citizen, the owner of the company. He fled back to Israel, but in 2016, he came back to the United States, and since then, he has been living in the San Francisco Bay Area. He works for a major contractor of major tech companies uh, like Google and Microsoft, which themselves are also U.S. government contractors. And prior to that, he worked for a telecommunications company called Granite Telecommunications that works for the U.S. military and a bunch of other government agencies. Okay. So apparently that's fine. Okay. So a couple of things I just want to check on this. So first off, when you say, the, I, I want to be clear. The FBI said that this company, this moving company, is it Urban Moving? Is that what it is? Urban Moving Systems. Urban yes. Moving Systems. The FBI okay. said that. Okay, the FBI said it was a Mossad front, correct? Yes, yes. The, the direct quote is we're, uh, that this company, quote, we're conducting a Mossad surveillance op a mission and that their employer, Urban Moving Systems, of Weehawken, New Jersey, serve as a front, end quote. That's okay, then the, you, you, the you mentioned the media uh, coverage of this. What I would say, Garland, that seems like a very big story, wouldn't you? It's gigantic. That, that the Mossad, a, uh, a, a spy agency, that, that the FBI said it. This is, as Whitney says, this is not just somebody calling into a radio show saying that. And she's urging people, read the actual FBI report, which, by the way, tell people where they can find your article so they can get to that, Whitney. We, we republished it on Met Press News just yesterday because um, I knew I was going to be doing this interview. So you can just go to the Met Press News website. It's like the first or second story up when you scroll down below the top story. And we will, and I will also put it on my Twitter feed uh, with a link to it in case somebody is too lazy to type in mintpressnews.com and, and, and read that, which is possible. Because some people may be. Some people are busy. It happens. Yeah, yeah, it does happen. But I will put that on there. But but the fact that, look, the fact, just talk about You've researched this story. What was the media reaction to this? Was there big coverage at, at places like the mainstream media, New York Times and so on, where they did investigative pieces following up on it, tracking it down the Washington Post, or new media, did the Breitbart News or any of those? Who covered well, this? Oh, and add, and add, no, one, it, it, add one other thing to that, if, if you would, uh, when you're doing that, I understand there was some media coverage that some of these people were actually on TV in Israel. So in, in the media coverage here, uh, we also too. add to Israel too. Okay, so in, in the U.S., there was a, um, a Fox News investigative report in December 2001 that was done by Carl Cameron. It's really hard to find right now, but you can still find an archive version on, on YouTube. And they discussed um, these, um, the, the arrest of these Israeli is, uh, nationals as well as um, other Israeli surveillance operations and Mossad operations going on in New York City at the time that 9-11 took place. Um, you can find it out if you look up um, Israeli software spying on, on U.S. Amdoc, Converse, Infosys, Carl Cameron. If you put that into to YouTube, it should come up. So please, um, I encourage you to watch that. Watch that. They ask a lot of uh, questions. And basically, um, what what Carl Cameron concluded is that, um, well, he was told by a top government official anyway, and he says this in the report, that there was no way that, they, that uh, the Mossad could not have known that the attacks were going to happen is basically what... Um, uh, the conclusion of that report was that they clearly had foreknowledge of, of this attack. And then um, ABC News also did a story about um, about urban moving systems and the bans um, and, and about the people celebrating. Um, and it's mentioned in there, but you, you can only find that um, as an archived uh, a news report. It was on ABC. Um, but um, I, I include that in the report as well. So like in the uh, third paragraph of my report, or no, Sorry, the, the, the second paragraph of my report, I talk about coverage in the mainstream media, and I provide three links there. So you, you, for, you didn't mention uh, the uh, it, you didn't mention the, uh, the, the whether or not that the, because I had heard that the some of those people had gone on television or a talk show or something. Is right? You know? Yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. Getting there now. They went on in an Israeli uh, after they were released from the U.S. They were deported, um, and even though there was. Um, there was resistance to sending them back to Israel. Local Muhammad Turkey and struck, Mama um, between uh, the, the U.S. And, and the Israeli government that had them sent back. But basically, they um, went on TV and um, 
it basically explaining, uh, trying to explain their experience and things like that. And one of them said that the reason they had been there taking pictures is that they, um, they, they were sent there to document the event. That was the quote. Document. And what time, you know, we know what time it's, you know, the event it happened, you know, between eight and nine. What time do we know what time they arrived at the location that they were, to, you know, to, uh, ostensibly, I guess, to watch the event? Well, so one of the, the main eyewitnesses here um, who called the FBI said that as soon as she heard the explosion from the plane, she looked out her window and she saw, you know, the, the first tower on, on fire. And then she looked down and saw these guys. So they had been there minutes before, at least, you know, to, to be in that position. They were parked in on top of a van, you know. Um, <laughs> so it, it seems like they must have been there at least a couple minutes before. But then, as I mentioned earlier, there was one eyewitness who said that they saw their van and saw them around the van um, as early as 8 a.m., which would be around 46 minutes or so before the first plane hit the first tower. Now, let's also, let's say, as we seg to the, uh, to the Jeff Epstein reporting, Let's talk about Ehud Barak this for a second. Important. What's Where going was on at the Ehud same Barak, 9-11, 2001? Do you remember? Do you know what? Because I've seen Ehud Barak. His name has come up in connection with 9-11. Have you seen that? Yeah, but I haven't I haven't looked into his role um, or his, you know, what he was doing and, and all that stuff specifically. I know that he uh, was pretty much the first person on national U.S. TV to say Osama bin Laden was responsible for 9-11. Yeah, which is, which, uh, just note that. And again, I, I, are you saying that, uh, I want, want to be clear, what are you, let, just uh, do this and then we'll, we'll move on to the Epstein stuff. What are you not saying here? Let's just be clear on that. What are you not, so you're saying the FBI report says all this stuff. Where are you not willing to go on this story? Where are you willing to go and where are not you willing not to go? Um, well, I think it's pretty clear that there was um, Mossad foreknowledge of the event and there was a, um, a, a cover up of that because not only were these guys arrested in 9-11 in the New York metropolitan area, um, there were a total of 60 Israeli nationals. Um, we know that there was surveillance, um, uh, unusual Mossad activity in, in the country and in New York during that time. This is also uh, following up after the um, wiretapping by Israel of the White House and a bunch of other things going on. We also know that um, you know, things like uh, Jeffrey Epstein's sexual blackmail operation was also going on during this time. So um, I think it is, um, you know, th there's a lot to be asked here. And the fact that this was never meaningfully investigated, I think, is really, um, really troubling. I think at the very least, it strongly su suggests um, foreknowledge um, of Israeli intelligence, of, of what was going on in 9-11. The fact that they chose to, that these individuals chose to celebrate that, um, I think is really troubling. Um, and when you look at the official reason these guys said they were celebrating, um, it, it um, you know, what they told the FBI anyway, they basically said um, that they, they, they thought that now Americans would not be naive anymore and that they would understand why Israel is the way it is. And that is basically what Netanyahu said um, just a few days after the attack. Um, so there was a lot of, um, you know, and, and, and Netanyahu also, you know, um, I think it was in 2008, he said, we are benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. His first reaction, Netanyahu, he wasn't prime minister at the time, but when he was asked, um, I think by the New York Times, his first reaction was to say, it's very good about 9-11. And then he quickly added, well, not very good, but it will generate immediate sympathy. <laughs> Wow, is that not wonderful? Uh, I, uh, uh, really the internet is great, um, in terms of, uh, of, um, you know, coming, coming up with interesting stuff that's, uh, important for us to know. So, uh, moving down, we're running a little over time, but we have a big agenda. Uh, the next thing on the agenda, uh, which I talked about in the beginning, was my own experience uh, on 9-11, which I shared, uh, seeing mysterious visitors. And here's uh, the article in Westview uh, that um, I published, that uh, I wrote uh, to uh, uh, explain, let's see if I can get it on, uh, to explain um, my... Uh, activities uh what uh, my my memories of of what i saw uh on uh going on in the 95th floor of fiduciary trust 
um, the mysterious visitors who were carrying heavy bags and disappearing down locked corridors uh, who were not part of the normal um, maintenance men or staff of, of uh, the World Trade Center without the badges around their necks or the normal uniform. So, um, you know, I described the memory of the mysterious visitors, but interesting, another, I only found out about this uh, last month that another uh, guy uh, named Scott Forbes, who also worked for Duchery Trust on a different floor than me, um, said that there was a uh, deliberate power down on the weekend prior to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Um, according to Sean Forbes, the senior database administrator for fiduciary trust, uh, a high net investment bank that was later acquired by Franklin Templeton, this is what precisely took place. Forbes was hired by fiduciary in 1999, is now stationed at his UK branch, was working on the weekend of September 8th and 9th, 2001, and said that his company had give, was given three weeks advance notice that the New York Port Authority would take out power in the South Tower from the 48th floor. Up, 48th floor up. The reason? The Port Authority is performing a cabling upgrade to increase the World Trade Center's computer bandwidth. Forbes stated that uh, that fiduciary trust was one of the WTC's first occupants after it was erected, and that a power down had never been initiated prior to this occasion. He also stated that his company put forth a huge investment in time and resources to take down their computer systems due to the deliberate power outage. This process, Forbes recall, began early Saturday morning, September 8th, continued to mid-Sunday afternoon, September 9th, approximately 10 hours. As a result of having its electricity cut, the WTC security cameras were rendered inoperative. No security cameras, guys. As were its ID systems and elevators to the upper floor, so nothing was working. There was power to the WTC's lower floors and that there were plenty of engineers going in and out of the WTC who had free access throughout the building due to its security system being knocked out. In a message to a journalist, uh, Forbes wrote, without power, there were no security cameras, no security locks in the doors and many, many, quote, engineers coming in and out of the tower. Forbes didn't think much of the occurrence at the time and said that he worked until Monday morning, September 10th, to get all the computer systems back online. Due to his IT-related duties on Saturday and Sunday, Forbes had Tuesday, September 11th off and thus watched the World Trade Center tower collapse from his apartment. While doing so, he recalled, I was convinced immediately that something was happening related to the weekend work. FBI agents that were already on the streets surrounding the WTC complex only minutes after the manual initial strike. Last but not least, uh, Ann Tachloff, CEO of Fiduciary Trust and now a board member of Franklin Templeton, had just arrived at a conference hosted by Warren Buffett at the Offutt Airfoot Base, home of the U.S. Strategic Command headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, when the 9-11 attacks took place. Coincidentally, later that day, President George W. Bush flew into this very same Air Force, same base on Air Force One for security reasons. Jeffrey, Even more um, chilling are the Offutt AFB ties to the CIA MK Ultra experiments, Project Monarch, the Franklin cover up, and the diabolical practices of Michael Aquino. In the end, Forbes says that even though these disclosures could jeopardize his current employee employment, he has stepped forward because, quote, I have mailed this information to many people, including the 9 11 Commission but no one seems to be registering this fax. So, uh, you know, this is information uh, that a lot of people don't have any idea about. And you heard it here. 
on Zoom Palestine first. Um, and uh, uh, then we were going to end with talking about the censorship of, uh, uh, of um, events of 9-11. And we're very aware of all the, um, the uh, efforts um, that have been going on uh, for uh, censoring uh, um, everybody. Uh, 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 most recently, uh, censoring uh, Spike Lee. But uh, as we all know, um, it's uh, one cannot uh, in mainstream media ever say anything about uh, Israeli uh, complicity or be critical of Israel. Even and Rachel Maddow, who I watch daily, I have never seen her ever say a peep or a squeak uh, critical of Israel. Um, and I, I think mainstream media is just <clears throat> locked up in uh, refusing to uh, discuss it. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is and we're waiting for the upcoming release of um, government documents on 9-11. But uh, one of the problems with this whole topic uh, is the um, growth of anti-Semitism that has come about uh, because of um, people now being suspicious of Israel. And unfortunately, that translates into uh, all Jews caught in the net of Israel, although I don't know any of my, I know some of my Jewish family are uh, support Israel, but nobody else, none of my Jewish friends and most of my family are critical of uh, Israel and of the occupation of Palestine. However, you have people like the ADL who are um, vigilant about uh, any uh, possibility of, um, of uh, criticism of Israel. And unfortunately, they put everything together in one bag. Hi, Jenny Lim, thank you for uh, coming, for joining us. So um, here's an article by the ADL, and I think it's fair to, uh, to realize that the um, anti-Semitism is always latent in Western culture, uh, and, and global culture, actually, and it doesn't take uh, much to stir it up. And um, the problem is, of course, is that uh, Israel does stuff, and then all Jews around the world get blamed for it, which, of course, uh, they're not responsible. Many of the Jews don't live in Israel. Uh, they prefer to live uh, in New York or other places because they don't like Israel. They don't like what's going on. So, but ADL has, has done a report on the uh, lean anti-Semitism to all 9-11 conspiracy theories uh, and truth or 9-11 truth or activities. I used to go with uh, Salvador Peter Tomas, my good friend who just died at 101 last month. Uh, we used to go to the 9-11 truth events at St. Mark's in the Bowery for years. Um, and uh, all of these uh, events were not anti-Semitic, but according to ADL, uh, to imply that the Mossad was behind the attacks is something that, that concerns them, uh, that Jewish neoconservatives were behind the attacks. Now, I think there's a, something we have to talk about, <clears throat> the distinction whether between two things. Number one, Israel knew about the attacks beforehand. Two, Israel was responsible for the attacks. Those are two very separate issues. Um, so the fact that uh, blaming Mossad or uh, Jews for the attacks um, has, there's really not, not a lot of proof about that, uh, but they're getting blamed anyway, uh, and this is uh, a big, big problem. Uh, and that the Jewish controlled media and government manipulated narratives about the attacks and worked to prevent the truth from emerging. Um, you can... Uh, um, Think about this, and, and we know that um, that ADL and APAC are very active in attacking anybody who uh, says anything uh, anti-Israel. So uh, this is a conspiracy theory um, that the attacks, the truth about Israel and Jewish involvement have been suppressed because Jews control the media and government, including the 9-11 Commission, and that powerful Jews have manipulated information. So we don't um, this is something that concerns uh, the ADL, but 
of the fact that Spike Lee just gave up uh, edit, editing his documentary. Um, uh, it puts a little bit of a, a, of a spin on that one. Uh, that Jews or Israelis had foreknowledge of the attacks. Uh, this is considered anti-Semitic, but um, you know the uh, government, uh, the FBI documents state pretty clearly that Mossad did know ahead of time. So the problem with ADL is it, it puts everything in the same basket. Um, and um, this is not good for Jews in general to um, not uh, be able to distinguish between Mossad policies and anti-Semitism. Then Zionists exploited the 9-11 attacks to expand surveillance, surveillance of American citizens. This is considered a conspiracy theory that's anti-Semitic, but um, uh, there's some factual basis to that. Uh, the technical details of the attacks don't add up, therefore the entire uh, historical narrative must be fraudulent. Um, and so that the official story of 9-11 is not really what happened. Well, you know, a lot of people believe that, uh, and the 9-11, the documents as they're being released are very important. So um, we really need to uh, suspend judgment about all of this until we have all the data and facts, and we don't have it now. Uh, the other thing that is anti-Semitic, uh, according to ADL, is Jewish ownership of the World Trade Center and the conspiracies focused on what Jewish owners the World Trade Center stood to gain from this destruction. And of course, Larry Silverstein, um, you know, he's a real estate, uh, you know, uh, greedy real estate owner. Um, and he had recently taken out a lease on the center, uh, um, giving him more money uh, in case of an accident. And then uh, uh, that they claim he plotted to destroy the towers in efforts to obtain millions of dollars in insurance money. Uh, this is a uh, conspiracy theory, incorporates the anti-Semitic trope of Jewish lightning and goes to the heart of the myth of the greedy Jew. Um, so I think uh, all these things are, uh, we have to be extremely careful um, not to uh, put together in the same basket of Israel, Mossad, and all Jews around the world. Uh, and this has been one of my great fears that uh, that the anti-Semitism would grow um, because uh, of what Israel is doing and continues to do. Hi, Hamid Khan and Shadab, Shadab welcome. Um, that uh, Jews, around the world cannot be held responsible for what Israel does. Uh, personally, uh, all of my Jewish friends in New York uh, reject Netanyahu and they're not living in Israel because they don't like what Israel's doing and what's going on. And I know a lot of Israelis who've come here uh, to get away from uh, Israel um, and Israeli policies. And it's of course the only Western uh, so-called democracy that still has conscription. And you may have read recently about several uh, uh, Israelis who refused to go into the army. Uh, they didn't want to do the occupation. And of course, you have that group breaking the silence of ex-IDF soldiers who are penitent uh, and traumatized by what they were forced to do uh, in, to Palestinians during the occupation. So um, one size does not fit all. We can't blame all Jews for what Israel does. And this is the danger of anti-Semitism. Uh, when I was teaching in Jordan, I had a lot of Palestinian students and uh, some of them would, would doodle swastikas and I, we love Hitler in their notebooks. And I said to them, listen guys, because of Hitler and the Nazis, you lost your home. If it wasn't for Hitler, you would be sitting back in your beautiful home in Ramallah or Nablus or whatever. Don't blame the Jews, blame Hitler for your condition because he's the one who caused you to lose your homes. So uh, I think that we have to look um, with a sense of balance uh, and humanity and understand, um, look, I'm an American, but don't blame me for the invasion of Iraq or Afghanistan. I marched in every protest there was and signed every petition there was. So. 
Um, just because you have a national identity doesn't mean you agree with the policies of your government or your religion or whatever group you identify with. I'm white, but I support Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm a Christian, but I support uh, Islam and people from other faiths. So I think we uh, need to um, develop a sense of humanity when we look at these issues and not um, put everybody in one basket. Jews cannot be blamed for what Israel is doing. And there are plenty of Jewish groups speaking up and speaking out about it. And the last thing we were going to talk about, who gained the most from 9-11? Who lost the most? So I want to ask if anybody wants to contribute. Uh, Farid is gone. Uh, Dina, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, uh, Hamid Khan is watching. Uh, Shadab, if you want to type in the comments, who do you think uh, lost the most from 9-11? Who do you think gained the most from 9-11? Anybody want to say anything? Mary? You want to say anything? Unmute yourself. No. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave it an open question. Uh, Wait a minute. Did, did you ask me? Well, yeah, I, who do you think gained the most? And who do you think well, lost the most? Um, I, I guess I have a question to ask you. Uh, you focused in on Israel. There were other conspiracy theories as well. Yes, I didn't have time to go through all of them on this program. I'm just focusing on now, Palestine and Israel. That's true. From from my observation at that time, I thought the United States was involved in it because it it be it was revealed that there were people training at at. Uh, uh, airplane training centers that were only interested in finding out how to fly there, not on how to return. Right. And um, so, I mean, you know, there were all kinds of little theories at that time, including that Israel may have told the United States, shared it with the United States, but the United States was not innocent. And and I even read that uh, they weren't even interested in in going against Afghanistan initially. They were always thinking about Iraq. Yeah. Uh, Did you ever read the book, The Big Wedding? Uh, the guy who wrote it has a bookstore, kind of a leftist bookstore. And book, I forget his name. I, I can't Google it because I'm on Facebook uh, live as well. Uh, but anyhow, he, he, this book is mind blowing. It's called The Big Wedding. It's worth reading. He discusses all the tips that were given by people all over the country, all around the country to the FBI, to the government, that something was going to happen at the World Trade Center involving the airplanes. And they were ignored. Uh, one of the most interesting stories. I don't know whether they were ignored. You know, that's oh, no, the thing. They, I, well, I don't, they, I don't think so. They allowed it to happen. They you were know, told that it was going to happen. George Bush, uh, George W. Bush president, when he was uh, reading the, the children at the school, you know, yeah. he, we know that he's a congenital liar yeah. because yeah. we got into the Iraq war yeah. as a result of a big lie. I mean, None of this was in isolation. I, it's hard to, I see it as, I see it as uh, an entree to the war on terrorism and to destabilize the Middle East and that Israel would benefit from it, no doubt. Yeah. But yeah. Israel, Israel has been bent from the first day and especially after 67, it becomes apparent yeah. of expanding Israel. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it'll use everything to its to achieve that through ethnic cleansing of one form or another. So I think that article you read that said that after 9-11, they began expanding the settlements. I didn't realize oh, that. Oh, they, they started right away. You know, there's a there's a UN resolution immediately immediately at 1967. You'll see it. And you'll see it uh, if you've read the uh, the words 
or the, the document that uh, Don Bickford sent to the IP committee, you'll see that right from 1967 immediately, I mean, if you, in the, all the books that we've read, so many of them at least, um, you know, are very clear about the fact that Israel was going to keep that. They didn't want, they don't view, they don't respect international law. They don't view it as occupied territory. Samaria and Judea, they call it. You know, it, it's, you know, anyway. Well, Frank uh, uh, Romano, you know, who's active in our program, he's in France now on his way to uh, uh, Lebanon to work, continue his work in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. But he just, uh, uh, gave another brief, he's a lawyer, and he gave another brief to the ICC. Um, and he included uh, Netanyahu, war crimes, Bush, uh, also Obama. Obama really um, did nothing uh, to stop Israel from uh, its carnage. So uh, we have to uh, hold people accountable. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm proud of Frank uh, submitting this brief uh, because uh, he was the only lawyer to really call out the American presidents uh, in this travesty. So, uh, yeah, it's a good, uh, we're still living with the consequences, the fiasco in Afghanistan, uh, the carnage um, there and in Iraq. Uh, I had many students who were refugees from Iraq, and I heard so many horror stories. Uh, it, it's just heartbreaking, and Americans are asleep. You know, we're asleep at the wheel. Uh, it's really, uh, so hopefully Palestine, our, the, the, um, our program, our little program, it's helping to give information to people uh, to wake them up, uh, to speak out, uh, pressure politicians. We need to use every tool uh, at our, um, that we can to uh, change the narrative and to uh, help address the situation in Palestine. It's only going to, go, going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. So uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, we went over time a little bit, but I think this is an extremely thank you. important topic to discuss. What I want to follow up on is um, Jeffrey Epstein blackmailing people, uh, government politicians during this whole 9-11 period. So uh, maybe we'll do uh, a future program. Uh, I have to, I know there's some people who know a lot about it, including Whitney Webb, who we heard from earlier, uh, but Epstein uh, uh, was very involved with Israel and Israel's uh, machinations. So uh, I think that would be an interesting uh, hot topic. And as I said, you know, Zoom Palestine, uh, we're not afraid. <laughs> we're not afraid to piss people off. And, and to, um, speak truth to power, as Gandhi said, that's what we have to do. Uh, because just speaking truth to power is powerful. The pen is mightier than the sword. To just tell it like it is, and that itself will bring about change. So thank you, Mary. And I want to give a plug for. Uh, I want to give a plug for this afternoon at three o'clock. Uh, code, code pink uh, oh, and a zillion other groups with a zillion uh, other yeah. great. Uh, yeah critics of, of the world situation in the U.S. and so forth. That's going to be on at three o'clock and it's That's really right. worth, uh, if you can see it, to see it or they'll probably oh, no, be It's online. Working. They're doing it online, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got the invitation from Code Pink. I think I signed up for it. I, yeah. There's so much going on. Okay. <laughs> so overwhelming. Yeah. Tomorrow I have my uh, event in the West Beth Community Room um, once they've stopped celebrating Fashion Week. Uh, uh, outside my window, uh, instead of uh, <laughs> as they're reading the, the names of the dead people in my house, I'm listening to the music and all the models prancing around like uh, horses at a, a state fair. Uh, <laughs> um, but I have to uh, burn the DVD uh, this afternoon of the uh, uh, film I made, a loop of the still photos from my loving people from uh, West Beth and the neighborhood sent me in marvelous photographs. So uh, tomorrow at West Beth, but they're only letting 35 people in. So I'm gonna try to film the event and uh, then make a, uh, you know, YouTube and I'll send it out to everybody. But my uh, film, I put a link uh, on my Facebook page to my film is called Aftermath 
9-11 in New York artist, and it's on YouTube under Jacqueline Casal, Taylor Basker, I used my grandmother's maiden name to confuse uh, people to trying to track me. <laughs> so that's my YouTube channel. And uh, it's a good film. It's a good film. Uh, and uh, many of the artists predicted 9-11 was going to happen uh, in their art. So if you see this film, you're gonna see some art done before 9-11 that predicts it. <laughs> Which is crazy. Great. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much, yeah, everybody. Thank you so much, Jackie. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, people on Facebook. Thank you very much for joining.